Welcome back. We're on Unit 6 of the Arts, and now we're on to Day 2. And today we're going to confront probably the most asked question uh, in the area of TOK and art, other than is this going to be on the test? And that is, is all art opinion? Let's start with some old business. Um, I'm hoping you're continuing to work on your unit assessment, first developing a rough draft of of the presentation and then transcribing those onto the assessment form and the assessment form is what you're going to be graded on as always if you get stuck contact me um, i'm trying to make these lessons a little bit shorter uh, to give you a little bit more time to work on the assessment well, let's get down to business again we always start by reviewing what i hope we've learned last time so let's go over that. Last time, we examined the scope of the arts and found that it, it, scope is pretty broad. It touches nearly every aspect of human experience. We also examined the ways of knowing and found that it also used all of the ways of knowing, although they may be used in different phases of the art, whether it's creation, reception by an audience, or evaluation of work of art, you might be using different areas of knowledge. And we examined another work of art, how Wang Fo was saved in two mediums, in print, either written or spoken word, and uh, visually. Hold on. Visually. From this, you were asked to generate a ses set of knowledge questions, and I also gave you a few more, okay? We concluded, or more accurately, I concluded, I argued that art as a form of creative expression is valuable because it enriches our experience. So we want to understand art because art adds something of value to our lives. Checklist. Again, we always have this. At the end of the day, here's what I hope you know. You should be able to articulate or form an argument as to why perhaps art is not simply opinion. You should be able to, nope, nope, I cut that out. So, good news, a little bit less to know. You should be able to explain the, I've got to reword this. You should be able to explain the nature of the zone of exchange and articulate the role of shared and personal knowledge in the arts. So let's get started. Again, the cosmic question in arts is all art opinion. The claim that art is, it's the claim that art is a purely subjective experience. And so therefore, art is simply a matter of taste. And this is a wildly popular view. And I would equate it to Remember how in each discipline we said we start with a naive view? This is the naive view of arts. It's just personal taste. However, that seems to run contrary to my claim that art is something that enriches all of our lives, because for this to be the case, there'd have to be something universally shared in works of art. In order to evaluate the claim of whether all art is purely subjective or not, I've asked you to read this Altuan article. And I know there were a bunch of questions in there. It wasn't necessary for you to write them out, but if you've considered them, then you're in a better position to work on the guided learning sheet today. Um, here we're concerned with, and what I wanna do right now is we're just gonna review what I think are the main ideas of that article. Uh, the article starts with the idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, a popular phrase, and it was defended by David Hume and Dewey. They both philosophers, one British, one American, who gave you the idea why someone might say art is purely subjective. However, strictly speaking, we do not, or let's be honest, I do not fully believe this, and I don't think most people do, as few people are going to seriously argue that a Beethoven 
symphony and elevator music. You may not be aware of elevator music is that kind of banal music that you hear in shopping malls or you hear again in elevate elevators. And the idea is few people are going to say that those are both works of art. So here's the tricky part. And I think the article does a good job of that. When pieces of art are relatively close on what Altuin calls a scale of merit, when we have two things that you know, are likely candidates for uh, works of art, we have a hard time deciding why one would be art and the other one wouldn't be. But when there's a vast discrepancy, as in this example, we seem to implicitly believe they're standards. So the problem we have is intuitively, we think there are some standards that tell whether something's a work of art or not, but we have a hard time explaining what they are. So while it's difficult to define standards, we all implicitly recognize standards, even though we struggle to define them. Um, and in defense of this, think of the assessment, I don't want to think of assessments, but just for imagine, go dark, think of assessments in IB art and theater classes. Don't you have guidelines according to which your works are judged? Or take your favorite form of art. Doesn't it have certain rules? I'm drawing on these from the uh, article. You know, music has guidelines about harmony and structure, and painting has guidelines guidelines about uh, balance and tone. So it would seem that, you know, art isn't purely subjective. There seem to be some guidelines on how you create it and how you understand it. So in answer to the question, is all art opinion, we might say the following. Well, a lot of it is. And there's always some subjective element to our understanding of art. However, on the other hand, the counterclaim here, we implicitly recognize that there are some standards even though it's easy to apply them when the works of art are very different, what we perceive to be their quality, and they're very hard when things are closer. So if, we, if I'm going to argue art is not all opinion, then we have to ask, okay, well, so does that mean we can study art? Um, and if there are some standards in art, and if at some level we recognize that some things are art and some are not, even if we can't always say why, then we must conclude that to claim all art is opinion, it's not wrong, it's probably an oversimplification. And if it is an oversimplification, then we need to examine the arts more closely to find out what else besides our subjective reaction, which is valid, can we learn from them. Um, our guide through this whole thing um, is this paragraph from the, is this quote from the last paragraph of the Alchin article, and it's drawn from this art critic, uh, Ted Cohen. He says, I'm seriously, I am trying to understand why I, or anyone else for that matter, would seriously care to deny or assert that something is art. I've gotten this far. When I feel like insisting or denying that something is art, it is because I wish to insist or resist the idea that the thing is to be taken seriously, that there is a kind of obligation to recognize the thing as a significant item in my life. And I've gotten this much further. To explain the significance of the thing in my life, I must suppose that it also has a place or deserves to have a place in the lives of others. That's as far as I've gotten. Well, this is our guideline and our purpose for studying the arts in TOK, because when we have a work of art, we think that it is something that other people would benefit from knowing about. So we get to the question, are there rules in art? Well, here's our starting point. We've argued that art is not purely subjective. And there seems to be standards for understanding art. Now, these standards are not purely objective, and, and they seem to differ not just from art form to art form, but within an art form. So, for example, there may be different guidelines for non-representational, you know, modern or abstract art, as opposed to more traditional um, representational art, portraitures, landscapes, and the like. Uh, the first thing we want to do is 
give you an example of some kind of rules of art. So the first thing I would like you to do now is go, I'm going to pause, I want you to pause here in a moment. I want you to look at the handout on Google Classroom on uh, how to look at a painting. I got this from um, an AP art history book. So I want you to pause here to read this handout. And then on the day two guided learning sheet, I want you to answer the question. So we're going to pause now. And while it's pausing, I'm going to uh, open that sheet so that I can um, try to uh, give answers that we can compare. Remember, these answers will also, uh, you'll have a soft copy of these at four o'clock on the day of this class. All right, so I'm going to hand out, so I'm going to open up my day two answer sheet. Okay, so let's go over the answers. I know you can't see them, but I'm going to uh, read them and then you can double check them later in the day if you need to. Well, according to the, the handout from the AP Art History book, uh, there are five rules or guidelines discussed that allow us to better understand this painting. Um, one is composition. You have to understand that the canvas is divided into areas, in this case, two overlapping triangles. There are law, laws governing or guidelines for movement, how to use figures to convey movement. They're linked to themes in the painting. There are guidelines for unity and balance, how you link the themes of the different areas of the, I wrote campus, canvas. in a way that provides symmetry. There are rules governing color and contrast, how to use light and dark to express the emotions of the subjects. And there are rules about mood, using the portrayal of subjects to invoke a mood appropriate to the painting. And then I had some follow-up questions to, to kind of elicit your reactions to this. Um, you know, the question is, uh, do you think these rules are applicable to all paintings. And I argued that some of the rules, probably composition, unity, and balance, and perhaps color and contrast, may be applicable to all types of painting. Um, or I ask B to a certain category of painting, you need to specify. I would say certainly all of these guidelines would apply to representational art, that is, art that is mimicking or trying to represent physical reality. Does it apply only to understanding art or also to creating it? And my answer is it's pretty clear that Jericho, Jericho, the painter, had these ideas in mind when creating Raft of the Medusa. So it's most likely that these rules would apply to both the creation and to our understanding of painting. Would they apply to all forms of art? Well, it seems to me, again, I am no expert on art, but differing art forms such as music, literature, theater, or dance would no doubt have different guidelines, but they would still have guidelines for creating an, and understanding art. And then finally, the creative part of this, after all, it's art. You have to have a creative part. Try to come up with an example of a rule or guideline for the creation and appreciation of art in a favorite area of yours. Well, I would guess that um, if you've discussed the work of art that you put in that slideshow a couple days ago with anyone, that is, if what you think has passed into shared knowledge, you can present some kind of counterclaim, an instance where someone saw the work of art differently from you. Now it's hope that here you can explain how the interchange either deepened your understanding of the art, the exchange was productive or limited. You felt as though the other person was prejudging the work of art or judging according to inaccurate or outdated standards. So what I've asked you to do is Take what we've learned about art and apply it to the work of art that you came up with several days ago. All right. So now we, we're headed to our preliminary conclusion, our conclusion about this question of is all art 
subjective. Well, I would argue art is not entirely subjective as it seems different art forms have some rules or guidelines for creating and understanding art. So if it has rules, it must be at least partially objective. That means it must be open to a discussion about its meaning. And if there are rules or guidelines, at least within the different forms of art, meaning if literature, music, painting and dance each have their own guidelines and we recognize this, well then why do most people cling to the belief that art is purely opinion, purely subjective? Now in order to answer that, which is really the question of the day, we must look into how art passes from personal to shared knowledge to understand why it is people would claim that art is purely subjective. Again, the argument we're going to make is it starts out as purely object, uh, excuse me, subjective, but that ultimately there's also a component to it that is not purely subjective, that is shared knowledge, and it's open to investigation, evaluation, and that will give us a better understanding of art. All right, so now we're on to our last section for today, understanding the level of understanding in the arts. The simplest answer as to why most people believe art is subjective, that is purely opinion, is because of how we first encounter art. We react to being exposed to a piece of art. Often our reaction is purely subjective. That is, we have an immediate liking or disliking of piece of art that's based on a number of subjective features. You know, if we find it engaging, if we like the subject matter, if it elevates our mood. Of course, what all these have in common is that they're not really about the work of art itself. They're about our personal reaction to the work, our immediate and unreflective take on the work of art. Sometimes these favorites don't really stand the test of time and they become guilty pleasures. I think you've heard that term before. Things we enjoy even though we doubt they have artistic merit. We like them for how they make us feel or the memories they bring us back. And our attachment to them is largely emotional and immediate. And if that was all there was to understanding art, then it would be opinion. So most people think all art is opinion because they never go beyond their immediate reaction to it. However, that's not the TOK way. We're going to take a different and more in-depth approach to art. Okay, for lack of a better term, and I just made this up, I'm going to call this the iceberg theory of art. You've heard this a million times, you know. The iceberg, you see a little bit, bit of an ice flow on the top of the surface, and you don't realize how dangerous it is because two-thirds of the iceberg is below. Well, it's the same thing. Two-thirds of the knowledge and understanding of art is below the tip of the iceberg. The, so the tip of the iceberg in this terrible metaphor would represent personal knowledge of art, our reaction to it. And it's our natural starting, starting point in understanding art. But there are other levels below the water surface that we don't see, but that inform an important understanding aspect of the understanding of art. As we move downward to the deeper, deeper levels, we will pass from personal knowledge to shared knowledge. And this shared knowledge is where our understanding of art becomes more refined and more open to discussion. To learn about this, let us examine how personal knowledge in art, the opinion aspect that we've talked about so far, is transformed into shared knowledge. Now, these are not my uh, ideas. Um, let's give credit where credit is due. This, these are ideas that are developed by Dr Dombrowski in the TOK text. So if you want to understand this a little in a little bit more detail, you could go back and look at her section on the arts, which, which I think is the best chapter in the textbook. So our, we're going to talk about the production of knowledge, how we get from the personal, the purely all art is opinion aspect to shared knowledge, where there's something more objective about knowledge. So art begins as personal knowledge. In this case, the ideas of the artist even if they are following rules about the composition of painting, writing, or music, it is still their unique view. There's also a second aspect to personal knowledge. How the person, in this case maybe you, witnessing the art reacts to it. So this second type of reaction, the first is just the creative impulse. The second is you look at a work of art. This too is personal or subjective based on your mood, your temperament, your general preference about what, 
what you like. However, this type of personal knowledge where you react to the work art of art is different than the first example, the artist creating the art, because here the person is likely to express their view on the work of art, why they like it or don't like it. Now, the minute you express your personal opinion about art, art passes into the realm of shared knowledge, understood as the different perspectives that people can have regarding that work of art. As we argue and discuss, we articulate a view that can be compared with others. Of course, this is what any true artist wants to create a conversation around their work. In entering into any such discussion, we're clearly advancing our own understanding beyond our initial subjective reaction. So we're getting a deep, deeper level. We're going below the surface of the iceberg. This ensuing discussion, however, just to be fair, can be a double-edged sword, meaning when we discuss, share our perspectives with others, that can either be productive or can be limiting. It's productive if you keep an open mind and if you in examining multiple perspectives, we understand more about the work of art than we did before. However, it can be limited if we simply judge the work of art according to preconceived notions and perhaps miss the real insight of the work. So you may be discussing a work of art with someone and you may find yourself disagreeing with their perspective because you feel they're judging it according to a set of standards that's not really fair to the work of art. And in that case, that's limiting. Now, Dombrowski calls this act we're talking about here, where you give voice to your subjective opinion and the resulting introduction of multiple perspectives as the zone of exchange. This is a very interesting insight. It's the place where personal knowledge begins its transformation into shared knowledge. Now, we want to work with this a little bit, so I'm going to ask you to pause the screencast and answer the questions in the From Personal to Shared Knowledge section of the Day 2 Guided Learning Sheet. And um, we'll go over these. Um, so in that section, I, I said I would like you to take the work of art you selected last class and examine it in light of today's discussion. What was your initial reason for being drawn to the work of art? Was it based on your knowledge of the arts or in some innate liking of the presentation? And I hope in your answer, uh, you, there are probably a couple answers. You might just have, it might have been just a purely subjective reaction. You like the work of art. But if that's the case, I hope that by talking about the work of art with other people, you began to learn other things about the artist's intention, about the meaning of the art, and that deepened your understanding. Or it could have been you're already uh, knowledgeable in the field of whatever art work of art you chose. And that was that kind of informed opinion was already giving you a deeper understanding. But in both cases, clearly there is a deeper understanding to be gained either from talking to someone else or reading about something um, to the work of art than just your initial subjective reaction. And then I wanted you to imagine what others might say, especially someone who might disagree with your work and what it would be enhanced or not. And it's kind of the same kind of thing. When you have a discussion with other people, uh, a productive discussion shows you things about the work of art you didn't understand, implications that you didn't get, and that could broaden your, your understanding of the work of art. Or sadly enough, sometimes um, when you look at other opinions, you might feel that those opinions have kind of missed the point of the work of art or judging it according to the wrong set of standards. And, and, and that would be limiting. It would be like asking me something about rap or hip hop music. Since I don't really know and don't understand it, I'm sure I would be judging it according to an artificial set, another type of music set of standards, and that wouldn't be really fair. And then you really wouldn't learn much from that kind of interchange. So the idea is from personal shared knowledge, this exercise was designed to give you some kind of understanding of how this zone of exchange that transfers us from personal shared knowledge operates. All right, so let's wrap this up. This is where I'm going to leave the lesson today because I think we've sufficiently answered the question 
is all art opinion. I am also, as I said, planning on making these lessons a bit shorter so you have more time to work on the assessment. So here's where we are on our journey to understand the arts. Yes, art begins as subjective expression, subjective expression of the artist who created the work, the subjective reaction of the person who viewed the work of art. This initial, initial stage is the basis for the oversimplified, not false, but oversimplified claim that all art is opinion. At the first level, that's a true statement. And if there never were any transformation from personal to shared knowledge, that would be the last word in the topic. However, when we voice our subjective reactions to a work of art, we enter a zone of exchange where, at some level, we're now dealing with shared knowledge and the subsequent treatment of the work of art is no longer purely subjective. In the coming classes, we'll be dealing in more detail with these levels of shared knowledge. Before you go, check your understanding against the checklist at the start of the screencast. So I hope that by today, end of today, you'll be able, or after you compare your answers to mine later on in the day, you will be able to articulate an argument as to why perhaps art is not simply opinion that you can explain the nature of this zone of exchange that we borrowed from Dombrowski, borrowed, such a good term, and you should be able to articulate the role of shared and personal knowledge in the arts. All right. So coming back down here to see if there's anything left. Nope, that's it. Uh, if questions remain, email me or have your questions ready for our weekly video conference. Until then, be safe, be happy, and I'll talk to you on the video conference. Bye.